All right. Good evening, folks. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. I am so very glad that we are back to Wednesday nights. Whether you are in the building with us or whether you're watching online, as you know, there was uh, months where we weren't really doing a full Bible study. I had some of my pastoral staff, Pastor Jimmy, Pastor Ethan, they were kind of giving short little clips on Sunday and Wednesday nights. Short and sweet, but uh, it wasn't really the full Bible study, and I'm so happy to be back to it and uh, hope that you folks are enjoying listening as much as I'm enjoying speaking. I don't know if that's possible or not. I really enjoy speaking. But uh, we're in Judges chapter 2 tonight. We're uh, part two of a 16-week series on the book of Judges. Now, last week, we kind of just started with an inter introduction to the book, and we looked at chapter 1, getting into just the first handful of verses in chapter 2. Tonight, we're only going to be in chapter 2, and we're going to deal with really two big questions. There will be some other things we'll be talking about, but two big questions that I feel are, are very applicable today to parents and families, and, and it's interesting that some of the things that people have been struggling with for literally thousands of years, we still struggle with today, and we think, oh, you know, it's so bad today. Remember the good old days, and I wish that we could go back to those days and Today is the worst that the world's ever seen politically and with division and immorality. Folks, look in the Bible, and I'll tell you, the worst day was Noah's day, all right? So let's just get that out of the way right now. We are not living in the worst of days. Now, nor is it going to get better from here necessarily. There is going to be worse days. Noah's day was the worst. The tribulation will be even worse than that. <laughs> So you are not living in the worst of days. Let me just kind of clear that up for you. I understand it's bad, but here's the truth. We live in a sinful world. There's really always potential for bad. Yes, there are ebbs and flows, ups and downs of, of Christians doing well and, and being the leaders and then Christians kind of hiding in the shadows and the world kind of standing up in the forefront and say, follow me. And there's this constant battle, but we were warned of that battle. Christ told us that the world's going to hate us. Christ told us that, that they hated him first. And, and we're told we live in spiritual darkness, surrounded by spiritual darkness, and we are the light to that spiritual darkness. So if you're expecting that the whole world will be enlightened, then you're not reading your scripture. The church's job is to spread the light in a dark world, and it is dark right now. Now, the book of Judges was also a dark time. And during this time, there is, of course, Joshua. We read about him last week. We talked about him, how Joshua, the guy, marched around the wall seven times. Joshua, uh, you might call the disciple of Moses or the follower of Moses, ultimately the follower of God. But he, he was, he was uh, the, next, the next man in charge after Moses. He takes the Israelites into the promised land. He's told by God how to take and defeat the promised land. Joshua does a pretty good job of following God's commands. He makes some minor mistakes, which unfortunately have major consequences isn't that the case sometimes? You think, wow, I mean, the decision I made wasn't really that big of a mistake. It was such a minor thing. You can choose your, your mistakes. You can't choose the consequences of those mistakes. You can't decide how big of an impact those mistakes are going to have on your life or other people's lives. And Joshua made what seemed to be just some minor mistakes, and yet there were some big impacts. Now, we're in Judges, not Joshua, so we're going to move on from that. We are now, Judges chapter 2. And verse number 6, And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. So basically there was a massive uh, revival. Remember, I told you God himself, Jesus Christ, came to earth, preached to Joshua and the Israelites. This is a separate sermon from the end of Joshua, chapter 24, where Joshua said, Choose you this day whom you will serve. This is a separate message, a separate revival. Jesus Christ is the one preaching this revival. That's a revival I'd want to be at. After that happens, after he's done, the people go back to their land and basically just live their lives. Well, Joshua dies soon after, verse 8. He's 110 years old when he dies. Verse 9, they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timoth Heres, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gesh. And also, verse 10, all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. All what generation? All of the folks who were alive during Joshua's days. They eventually died as well. And so what are you left with? You're left with a bunch of the next generation. Right? Isn't that always the case? We're always going to be eventually left with the next generation. You know what I find? As I talk to the previous generations, they are concerned for the next generation. 
Now, for the previous generations, the next generation aren't the 20-year-olds. The next generation for them were currently the 30 and 40-year-olds. And when they were younger, they were concerned for the 30 and 40-year-olds. And now the, those who were the next generation 30 years ago, we are now looking at the next generation now. And guess what we are? We are concerned. <laughs> it seems like a repeat pattern that adults, once they hit mid-30s and start to settle down and start to gain some maturity at, at 30 to 40, not every, but many adults start to kind of gain some wisdom around that time. And once they start receiving wisdom, the foolishness of the next generation is so much clearer to them. And they say, what in the world? I'm concerned. <laughs> and, and so here we are living in that cycle. And that took place then. So here's two big questions we're going to talk about tonight and hopefully give you some answers to. And that is the first one. Why is there such a divide between parents who love God and children who run from God? Question number two, how does God respond to those who rebel against him? I can't tell you how many parents I've spoken to. They love God. And when I look at them, I, I, I see evidence of their love for God. And then I look at their children only because oftentimes they direct my attention to their children by saying, what happened to my children? <laughs> and I look at them and think, what did happen to your children? <laughs> how did that happen? Because I see you and I see them and I think, did they not live in your house? Were they living with someone else? Uh, did you not raise them? Because I'm not seeing the, the influence that you would expect of a child living in a Christian home. Now, of course, that is not with every child. That is not in every Christian home. But for those of you watching, if that's your home, it is a common problem. You're not alone. You're not the only family uh, as adults looking at maybe your teen or adult children even and saying, what happened? That is a question many parents are asking themselves. What happened? And in the book of Judges, Literally, 4,000-plus years ago, parents were asking themselves, what happened? <laughs> what happened to our children where they're the next generation and they're running from God? What is taking place where this generation gap is so massive that there is such a big difference between the parents' love for God and the children running from him? Well, I think there's some really important takeaways in the book of Judges. The great thing about the Bible is you often find there's a lesson repeated over and over again, not just in one spot, but this lesson is found in multiple locations. And oftentimes, a pastor, when they're preaching a message, will actually turn to another text and say, here's a support verse that teaches the same thing. And, you know, people love teaching from the New Testament. I love teaching from the New Testament. But many of the lessons you learn in the New Testament actually were already taught in the Old Testament. And things dealing with family and children and how to raise children, a lot of those are in the Old Testament. If not, do it this way. We learn them by seeing what people didn't do and saying, well, let's not do it that way because that's the wrong way. And Old Testament gives us that. So here we are, Judges chapter 2, generation gap, and how God deals with those who rebel against him. In verse 10, and also that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. We're going to just stay at verse 10 for a little bit and have a conversation. This generation didn't know the Lord. What does that mean? It doesn't mean they didn't know of the Lord. They knew of the Lord. They're Israelites. They're Jews. They came from Jewish families. The Jewish families would have taught their kids who God was. When it says they didn't know the Lord, what does that mean? It can only mean one of two things. Either we don't know him in our heads. It's not true. They did know him in their heads. So there's only one other place they cannot know him. Where is it, Maddie? I see you lipping it. It's the heart. All right. So you either know God in your head or your heart, preferably both, right? There's a lot of people who know God in their head but not in their heart. I don't know if it's possible to know God in your heart without knowing him in your head, at least to some degree. I mean, you got to know of God before you can really know God as a friend, right? But knowing him in your head is not enough. And so we have another generation who knew of God. They knew God in their head. This phrase, knew God, doesn't refer to an academic understanding. It refers to a heart of friendship. They had no connection with God. Whose fault was that? What do you think? Was it the parents' fault or the kids' fault? Oh, both. There we go. I got some wisdom over here from one of our senior saints. A lot of wisdom, Carla. It's both. It's both their faults. You can't put all the blame on the parents. 
every child has a free will. But do children raise themselves? I hope not. If they do, then we know what the problem is, right? <laughs> Hopefully, children are not raising themselves. Hopefully, the parents are raising the children, and therefore, the parents made some mistakes. Now, is it possible that mistakes were made? What would seem minor mistakes with big consequences? Yes, it is. That's how we started tonight's conversation. Yes, Joshua saw what that was like, made some minor mistakes. One of them was he was battling Jericho. It went so well in the book of jo Joshua. You'll read uh, seven times, marched around, walls came down, destroyed the city. Joshua said, man, I'm on a roll. Let's do this thing. Let's move on to Ai. And he says, we don't need nearly as many people. Ai is a smaller city. Uh, we're not going to wear out our soldiers. Let's give them a chance to kind of recu re recuperate from the last battle. He sent a smaller group to Ai, and they got slaughtered. Now, the issue was not that he miscalculated how many soldiers were needed to attack Ai. The issue was Joshua didn't go to the Lord and say, Lord, what should I do next? If he had, the Lord would have said, don't go anywhere. There's sin in the camp. You got a guy who's got some harboring some sin, Achan, hiding some gold, and that could have been dealt with, and Ai would have been defeated. Small mistake. Joshua made a decision, what seemed like a wise decision, but didn't ask the Lord's permission or advice. Big consequences. People lost their lives. Uh, wives lost their husbands. Kids lost their dads. Parents lost their boys. People's lives were lost and changed forever because of what was a small mistake by Joshua. Parents watching, parents in the room, I'm not telling you that if your kids strayed from God, oh, man, you must have made some massive mistakes. I mean, it must have been so big. Surely you didn't miss it. How could you have missed that? You know what probably was? It was probably some minor things you just didn't really consider deeply at the time. And Satan took those minor things and blew them up. Paired with the free will of the child, here we are today. A generation that doesn't know God in their heart. A generation running from God. Now, how about parents who are almost as near perfect as you can get? Does that mean they're going to automatically create near perfect children? Is that guaranteed? Of course not. It's not guaranteed in the Bible. But what about train up a child in the way he should go when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Well, that's taken from the book of Proverbs. That was not a promise that God gave the Israelites to say, do this and this will happen. The book of Proverbs is basically a book of wisdom. And it's, a, it's a, a series of sayings of general truths. And a general truth was if you raise a child a certain way, generally speaking, that child will do how you raise them to do, be how you raise them to be. Not necessarily in a spiritual condition, more so in character. That verse wasn't really dealing with a relationship with God, that wasn't the context. The verse was more character-wise. If you train a child to be polite, they'll be polite when they're older. If you train a child to be a hard worker and they're young, they'll be a hard worker when they're older. If you train a child to be honest, generally they'll be honest. That was the context of the verse. So let's not take that verse farther than we should, and let's not create that verse to be a promise when it's really just a wise saying. So here we have the book of Judges illustrating for us parents who obviously failed to do what? instill into the hearts of their kids more than just a head knowledge. I can't tell you how many parents I've spoken to. I've been working with families now since I was uh, 20 years old. I'm now 36, so 16 years, folks. I'll be turning 17, uh, 37 um, in a month. Almost 17 years I've been working with families. Like, man, time is flying. Okay. 17 years almost of working with families, and I've lost count of how many parents I've talked to. And they say things like, we went to church. Our kids went to a Christian school. I've even heard parents say, we did devotions. We loved God in our home. All right. Going to church does not instill into your child a love for God. Going to a Christian school. I'm a principal of a Christian school. I went to Christian school. I know Christian schools. I would love to say that Christian schools have perfect teachers and perfect kids, but if that was the case, your kid wouldn't be allowed. Neither would I have been allowed when I was a kid. Because for a Christian school to be, have to be perfect, it had to be non-existent. It doesn't exist. Because as soon as one person enters, it's no longer perfect. Christian schools are not perfect. They are not the answer to your family's problem. Well, we have the Bible in our home. We do devotions. Reading Scripture to your kids does not instill a love for God in their hearts. 
Well, then what's left, Pastor? Us? Seriously, I mean, you've taken all, everything from us. You know, go to church, Christian school, devotions. That's what we've been told, right? Do those things, and our kids will grow to love God. I'm sorry, someone or someone's lied to you. That's not in Scripture. It doesn't say if you go to church, your kids will love God. It doesn't say if your kids go to Christian school, which wasn't a thing back then, but if it was, it's not in there. It doesn't even say have devotions at home and your kids will love God. Well, then what is there? Here's the thing about love. It's two people. Always two. For it to be healthy love, it has to be two people. It can't just be God loving your child. It has to be your child loving God. So I'm going to tell you the truth now. Are you ready? You cannot instill love into your child's heart or God. You can't do that. Here's the problem with saying things like go to church, read the Bible, and Christian school fixes the problems. It's a false sense of security. There's a lot of other false senses of security going on right now, which I'm not going to discuss tonight, that people like to think if I do these things, I'll be okay, whether it's health, emotional, or spiritual, or otherwise. People like security even when it's false. Why? Because we don't want to feel lost. If we're going to be lost, at least don't feel lost. It's amazing how deceived people are willing to get just so they don't feel lost. And Christians aren't exempt. Christians are willing to be deceived with false sense of security so they feel good only to find out 20 years later what happened to my kids. Here's the thing about deception. It deceives you. Imagine that, right? But when you know the truth, you can address issues biblically and practically. So if you cannot instill the love of God into your child, and you can't, so don't think Christian school, church, or reading the Bible in your home is guaranteed to do that. They are not. They're all good things. You should do these things. They are not a guarantee. It's a false sense of security if you think you're guaranteed an end result from that. What these things do is introduce your child to God. Going to church introduces your child to God. Going to a Christian school introduces your child to God. Reading the Bible introduces your child to God. Think of it this way. There is... Another child that you think, wow, that child would be a really great friend for my child. I'd love for my child to be friends with that child. So what are you going to do? You're probably going to have that child over to your house and get with the parents and say, hey, can we have a play date? Can they get together, go to the pool, trampoline, whatever? You're going to try to have in some manner your child hang out with the other child and, and hope that a friendship results. You're going to encourage a friendship by allowing your child to be around this other child and hope that there's a connection. But you cannot force a love for those children into each other, either you know, two best friends or, or otherwise down the road. You can't do that. If you do, you're boarding on the line of abuse. If you're going to force, you will love that child. You will be their best friend, and you will have no one else you can hang out with except for that child. Is that child or nothing or no one? And you threaten the child. The child at a young age probably will go with that. And then what happens? The dreaded years we call middle school happens. And then the child says, I'm not putting up with this. I'm my own person. I've been abused my whole life. I've been forced my whole life. And now they literally run the opposite direction just out of spite. Parents with a false sense of security thinking by forcing their kids everything will turn out are actually very likely causing a worse end result. Yes, you should introduce your children to God, and you should surround your children with God, but you have to understand this core truth. Your children have to decide for themselves, do they love God? So what can you do? What's the best thing you can do? 
best thing you can do is to be the salt and light in your own home. More powerful than what church you attend. More valuable to your child's spiritual well-being than Christian versus public versus homeschool. More beneficial. Whoa. Did I really say that? Yeah. More beneficial than devotions in your home. To your children will be a sincere Christian life evidenced in your own. Can you believe that? That's the truth. You doing devotions and living like a reprobate heathen is not going to help your child. It will hurt them more than if you didn't do anything at all. You taking them to church but not living like the church outside of church will hurt your child, not help your child. You taking your child to a Christian school and then talking smack about that Christian school and what is taught at that Christian school doesn't help your child. Folks, go to church. A Christian school is a great thing. I'm a principal of a Christian school. I advocate for Christian schools. Do devotions at home. But here is the thing that will help your child succeed. Most likely get them to the point where they say, I want to love God. It is going to see you love God. You can tell your children about all God all you want, but if they don't know him in their heart, they will be the generation who runs from God. Well, Pastor Russ, in Judges chapter 2, we see parents who loved God. And we see parents who knew God. And then we see children who didn't know God. No, here's what I see. I see Joshua's generation who had a love for God, but were not really confident in God. Well, can we take them? They have chariots. Can we take them? They live in the mountains. Can we take them out? They're giants. And God actually said, you know what? Because you guys don't trust me, I'm going to leave these people in the land to show you that, that um, or to prove that you, you have to now uh, te be tested regularly. Do you love me or not? These were not perfect parents. These, there is no such thing as a perfect parent, but these parents were not on fire for God. <laughs> these parents were not uh, sold out for Christ. These parents had their own real struggles of faith, and it doesn't seem they really ever got a hold of, of the truth. It doesn't seem that they ever really overcame their weaknesses, and their small weaknesses became major problems in the lives of their kids. Parents watching, grandparents, aunts, uncles, your small sins will become the destructive sins of your children. If you do not address them, and if you let them overtake you, they will destroy your kids. We have people who loved God, Joshua's generation, who followed God, Joshua's generation, but were not willing to follow God wholeheartedly. They allowed their enemies to stay in the land out of fear. And it seemed even to intermingle with them. And that opened up the floodgates of destruction for their children. Small mistakes, folks, become big problems. Have I scared you? Well, we can't make any mistakes. If, if there's a small mistake becomes such a big problem, what can we do? Keep a tight check on your sins. And don't believe the deceptive lie that it's no big deal. Yelling at your kids, no big deal. Screaming at your spouse, no big deal. Immoral TV shows and movies played, no big deal. Don't believe it's no big deal. These are deals. Keep a short reign on your sins. Repent quickly. Confront them. And your kids will see, my parents aren't perfect, but they love God. And that will be the best thing for their spiritual condition than even church, Christian school, and devotions, possibly combined. Literally, you could live in the mountains somewhere, never do devotions, and yet live a life of love for God and just talk about God and just live for God. And your kids are probably better off spiritually than living and going to church every day and a Christian school and devotions and not living for God. Your kids would be better off in the mountains with none of those things but seeing their parents love and live for God. So how about it? For those of you without children, will you be that to someone else's child? Will you show someone else's child? Not tell. Tell is good. Show is better. 
will you show someone else's child? Say, Pastor Russ, where's the Bible for that? You sure are pulling a lot of stuff out of just one verse. Well, as I said, Scripture often deals with these things in more than one case. In the book of Matthew chapter 5, what does God say? Be the salt and light. That is show. That is showing, folks. The salt and light is a showing, not a telling necessarily. And that's what Christ said. He said, go and be the salt and light to the world. That's your job. He does tell them to tell before he goes to heaven. He says, now go and preach the word. Telling's part of it. But don't just tell without showing. Show and tell. When you don't do that, here's what you end up with, the generation gap. You end up with parents who love God but didn't necessarily live it out for the kids to see. And kids who say, well, forget that, and they run. You say, well, I did live it. Well, then, you know, you have to be honest with yourself. What small mistakes might have been made that had big consequences? Well, there really was none. Well, then, hey, if that's the case, I'm not saying that's not possible. If that's the case, then your, your child just made their own choice. And you can't force their love for God. If there were no big mistakes, if there were no small mistakes, and if there were mistakes, you addressed them and repented. And if you sh- truly loved God and your yet children are still running from him, then that is truly on the children. And at that point, you just need to pray that God will bring them back. But then be evidence of what the kind of Christian they can, they can come back to by showing them love even as they're running from God. The prodigal son father waiting for him. And when the son comes back, the father runs to meet him. Didn't wait and then beat him and kick him on the ground when he arrived. He ran to him, hugged him, and said, I'm so glad you're back. Be that kind of Christian to the ones running. Give them something to run back to. All right, now let's move on to the next verse. Verse 11, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. They forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods, gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. Verse 13, They forsook the Lord, served Baal and Asherah. All right, real quick, Baal and Asherah, you probably know a lot about them. Baal and Ashtaroth were two very common gods in the Old Testament, false gods. Think of, uh, like, Zeus, you know, Greek mythology Zeus. Baal would be like the, the Philistine, Canaanite, Old Testament version of, like, a Zeus, you know, like the god of gods, the king of gods. He was the head god. A lot of nations during that time had multiple gods that they served. Baal would have been, like, the head god of the surrounding nations. Uh, Baal, oftentimes, because of that, was referred to, the word Baal can also kind of mean general, God in general. He was a specific God that did have an idol. People did worship him. But sometimes his name would be used to refer to just gods. In fact, Balaam is the plural for gods in general. But there was a Baal God, the the head God, the big God. (laughs) Obviously a false one. He's just an idol, not a real deal. But that's what they thought. Ashtaroth would essentially have been like the female counterpart. Not necessarily his wife, but, you know, The male god and the female god, and they were both the head gods of the Old Testament uh, false worshipers. Now, the problem with these two, aside from the fact that they're false gods and not real, the real problem is the the kind of gods they were portrayed as, fertility gods, uh, gods of having children and and immorality. So I'm not going to get into detail, but let me just tell you, um, there are things that were done in the worship services that I would not be comfortable speaking of, and probably we would literally vomit if we were to witness what was being done at these worship services. L- worship services, not, not necessarily let's sacrifice someone to this God. It's let's go praise this God. And the things that they would do as they're praising this God and the people they do it with of all ages would cause you to throw up. These were the gods of the people surrounding the Israelites. These are the gods that God said, when you go there, get rid of them. Don't let them be around you. And these are the gods the Israelites said, ah, it's not that big of a deal. They're the city over. So, you know, it doesn't really affect us. Well, until your kids get old enough and say, I'm going to go on a trip. And guess where they go to on a trip to? I heard great things about the vacation spot, the city over. And they go the city over to vacation, and guess what they get exposed to? Yeah, all these things. And they come back and say, you're not going to believe what I saw or did or participated in. And then they bring it back. And now it's in your own city because it was just a city over. It was so close to home. You thought, well, it's not in my home. It's just close to home. Close to home becomes in home pretty quick. Another reason we see a generation gap 
there's a lot of Christian families who believe, well, you know, that philosophy's not in my home. Oh, but it's close to home. In what way? Well, your kids, when they go to someone else's house, they get it there. When they go to school, and I'm not just saying public, there's some Christian schools. When they go to school, they get it there. When they go to someone's house, maybe in the family, you know, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, maybe stepmom, stepdad, whatever, they, they go there, they get it there. It's not in the house where that child resides, but it's somewhere near enough that they could go experience it and come back. And let me tell you, experiences change you. And you don't have to experience something every day for it to change you. And so the gods of Baal and Ashtaroth were left in the promised land near home. And the parents who, when they had a chance to get it completely out, not even from the home, but even near the home, my kids will not even see it even close by, they didn't take that opportunity. They let these people stay. They let them have these deplorable worship services. Deplorable. And they said, well, it's not in our town. It's not in our village. But what was near home eventually became at home. And then when the parents died, the next generation said, let's just bring it home. And then you find the Jews themselves are now worshiping these gods in their own villages. It's not just the village next door. It's now every village has Baal and Ashtaroth worship throughout Israel. Deplorable sins taking place with people of all ages and probably even other things going on. And you expect God to say, no big deal. You expect God to wink at this? You expect God to say, well, I love you, so I'll let you get away with it. No, God is not pleased. So the next question we asked, how does God deal with rebellion? Parents, if we do not show the love of God, then God is probably going to have to be forced to show our children the wrath of God. Because if our children don't grow up loving God, they're going to grow up running from God. And they will get God's love because even in his wrath, God is love. But they're not going to see it that way. They're not going to say, oh, God's punishing me because he loves me. Someone who's running from God doesn't see it that way. We might see it because we're on this side of that. And we're saying, no, no, he's just trying to bring you back. But they're like, no, he's not. He's pushing me away because they're foolish, because they're running, because they're rebellious. Now, hopefully, eventually they'll get it. It'll click and say, wow, i got to stop running and i got to start to go back to him. Maybe, and hopefully they will, only after much pain and suffering. So please do everything in your power to show your child what it looks like to love God so they don't have to experience this level of wrath from him as they run from him. Unfortunately for some of us listening, it's a little late for some of us. Some of us have children, grown children. And they've already been running, are running, and are experiencing this very wrath that I'm talking about now. What can you do? It's never too late to show someone what it looks like to love God, even if your child's 35, 45, 65. I don't care. If they're alive and you're alive, what can you do? Pray for them and show them what the love of God looks like. That's what you can do. These parents made some mistakes. They allowed evil to be near the home. And eventually that evil came into the home. These parents made some mistakes. Although it seems they likely taught them about God, they didn't show them what it looked like to love God because they probably didn't really do it themselves from what we can see in their lives. And so these children become adults. They have families. They're running from God. How does God deal with rebellion? Chastises rebellion. That's how God deals with rebellion. God does not wink at rebellion. God does not ignore rebellion. God punishes it, as any good, loving parent would. The children may not see it as love, but the parent gives it in love for the sake of the children. So what is Judges chapter 2? You can read the rest of the text. I'm not going to read the rest for sake of time, but the rest of chapter 2, we're going to read some verses, but basically the rest just gives you kind of overview of what the rest of the book's going to look like. So let's see. 
In verse 14, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of the spoilers and spoiled them. And he, God, sold them, Israelites, into the hands of their enemies round about them. All right. First of all, did you know that anger is not a sin? Well, hmm, where is that in the Bible? Well, God doesn't sin. God's angry, therefore anger is not a sin. That's where I got it. And by the way, this is one of many texts where God is angry, <laughs> including Jesus Christ, God, in the New Testament, also angry. Anger is not a sin. Do not feel guilty for being angry or for feeling angry. Do not necessarily repent because you had an emotional response to something that bothers you. It's just an emotional response. Now, what you do with your anger, that's the sin. Jesus Christ dealt with that. And he says, if you say rock at your brother or swear at them and call them a fool, he says, that's as if you, you committed murder. The anger itself was not the problem. It was the fact that you let anger overtake you and control your actions in your mouth and now belittle, hurt, harm, and abuse people. That's the sin. But the emotional feeling, folks, we all have that. I'm a pastor. I get angry. I, I have that just as I get happy. Just because I, I, I'm happy doesn't mean I'm a nice person. Just because I get angry doesn't mean I'm a mean person. It's what I do with my happiness and my anger that really determines whether I'm a nice guy or not. But anger and happiness are just human responses to circumstances. Even God gets angry and happy. So hopefully that frees you a little bit to understand the difference between an emotional response and actual sin. By the way, let's quickly, not long, but just kind of briefly, it, it really applies to a lot of things. Um, the emotional response of, of even uh, an emotional attachment to someone, you know, that you just met and like, oh, I think I might like this person in a way that really is not appropriate for whatever reason. An emotional response itself is not the sin. Now, what you do with that, that's when it becomes a sin. You know, you dwell on that and you think about that person in inappropriate ways. Uh, then, we, then we got problems here. But just the fact that maybe you met someone and it caused you to feel a certain way, you can't really help how you feel sometimes. What you can help is what you think and do about how you feel. That you can help. Let me just be frank with you. Men, uh, you're tempted to look at a woman and think, man, she's pretty, she's attractive. That's not a sin. It's not a sin. Even if you're married, it's not a sin to have the, the initial thought that, wow, she's pretty. The sin, men, is when we keep going down that road. The sin, men, is when we consider that in inappropriate ways. That's the sin. What you do with that initial emotional response, dwelling on it, and even like David, turning it into action. Now we're really in trouble. But the emotional, the, the, the emotional initial emotion, whether it's a man or a woman, that's not the sin, folks. It's just anger is not the sin. God was angry. Now, God is just in his anger, but God is also loving in his anger. And so in his love and in his righteousness, he dealt with the Israelites. What did he do? He sold them. What does that mean, sold them? It means that basically the Israelites belong to God. And God said, because they belong to me, I can do whatever I want with them. <laughs> And so I'm going to put them under the judgment and punishment of another nation. It doesn't mean that God literally, like, you know, had an exchange of money. Obviously, money means nothing to God. The idea of sold means they were his possessions. Israel belongs to him and can do whatever he wants with them. And for a time, gave them over to punishment. Sold them to punishment. Which was basically, they were overtaken by another nation. And, you know, it talks about being enslaved and slavery sold to their enemies. It basically just means that uh, they were subject to another nation. Another nation o was over them. Sometimes the nations were cruel and re literally did enslave them. Other times they just had to pay tribute and basically couldn't own weapons or, or had to give some of their, you know, their, their food to them. It depended on the nation how bad it got. <laughs> but this was not a one-time thing. We read that um, after God would do this and after God would, would deal with their evil, verse 15 um, we read, when, when so, whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them. 
and they were greatly distressed. It has the, the distress has the idea of an emotional repentance, not necessarily, oh, we were wrong, we see it, we want to get right with God, we want to get saved. It's more so, man, we really hate our lives. <laughs> we hate this. We don't want to be in this anymore. You know, isn't it amazing God is so merciful? Throughout the book of Judges, we don't see Israelites getting saved, children running from God, falling under nations, getting saved, running from God, falling under nations, getting saved. That's not the pattern. The pattern is some are saved, many are not, but at least we're going to do an outward show of right because we don't want to be judged. Then the next generation or generations, let's get you know, further away from God, and then overtaken by nations. And then, man, we hate our life. So God says, all right, I'll give you a chance to see what it's like under me, brings them a judge, and they experience peace. God didn't wait for all the Israelites to get saved before he brought peace in their lives. God didn't wait for every Israelite to fall on their knees and repent and say, God, I want to go to heaven, please forgive me. And then God said, okay, now I'll fix everything in your life. God just waited till they were sick and tired of their own bad choices. And then God said, okay, now let me show you what it can be like under me. I really believe, honestly, I believe that there's probably a whole lot more salvations after the judges came and after peace was restored and after the Israelites saw, wow, this really is better. God is a good God. I personally, I, I can't prove it. I don't know. It's just an assumption after reading the Bible and the book of Judges in particular. I personally believe that there's probably a lot more salvations then rather than before of, oh, God, you know, forgive me. I'm sorry. Save me. And then God, you know, brings them to peace. I think the salvations probably came after the judges. It wasn't salvation then judge. I think it was judge and then, wow, God is good. I want to get saved. That's amazing how God works like that. You know, we don't often think like that. We think, well, if they want to get their lives fixed, they need to be saved. You know what? Really? Not necessarily. I'm not saying that's not a bad thing. But maybe all they need is just to recognize, I hate my life. <laughs> and I hate where my choices have brought me. And then God says, okay, now let me show you what it could be like. And I, you know, the old adage, uh, you can draw more flies with honey, right? And you can with whatever other bitter thing I guess you want to draw. Draw flies with. I don't know. What would you draw flies with, Scott? Honey. <laughs> want to get bees and whatever you draw with sweet stuff. You know, I think, I think God works in the same way. You know, yes, God does have judgment and wrath, but he does that to show them they're wrong, and I think what God actually does is draw them with love, though. I don't think God's looking to draw them with wrath. He's looking to correct them with wrath and then give them a chance to say, wow, I messed up, and then God says, yeah, now I'm going to draw you with love. So after they do this, and they, they're distressed, I hate my life, I hate my choices, God says, all right, now that you're, you're the bottom of the, of the pit, let me show you the alternative. And he brings, verse 16, a judge, judges into their life. And the judges uh, free them from the nations. And then the pattern repeats, unfortunately. Verse 17, after the judges die, the people then don't hearken to the Lord anymore, and they run from God, and then God has to punish them again, and they fall into uh, enslavement of some type of other nations. And then they hate their lives, and they hate their choices, and God shows a new generation. This is not necessarily the same person in one life. It was often, you know, decades apart. So one generation ran. The next generation says, man, I hate where our family is. And God says, let me try again with this generation. Brings that generation around, and then they're good, and then they have kids, and that generation runs. <laughs> it's a repeat pattern of what? Generational gap of parents who love God and kids who run from God. Over and over and over again, multiple times in Judges, kids not responding to God in the way we see their parents responding to God. This is nothing new, folks. So how do you want to break that pattern? How can you break that pattern in your family, in this community, in your church? You can read the rest of Judges chapter 2 on your own. Just so be clear here, in my Bible studies on Wednesday night, I do not read every verse. If I did, it would take a whole lot longer than 16 weeks for me to finish Judges. I teach the material of the chapters while reading some verses and then encouraging you to do the rest. By the way, you know where I'm going to be next week. I'll be in Judges chapter 3. So you are more than welcome and should read ahead. And that way when I do skip verses, you're already kind of pretty aware of what's going on. Some weeks I'll read more than two chapters. Some weeks I'll just do one. It might be even three, some. So, you know, as I'm going through, just kind of keep ahead of me, 
And that way, you'll be good for the Bible studies, and I don't need to read every verse, because I can't and I won't. So we are done with Judges chapter 2. So this generational gap, does it break your heart? It breaks mine. As a pastor, it breaks my heart to see parents who love, their, love God and the kids who don't. I, the problem is, I don't know what's going on at home. I can only see what's going on at church. And so I'm sure there's some reasons. There's, there's a disconnect there. But unless the parents open up to me, I can't really help them. I will tell you this. When parents have opened up and they've humbled themselves and come to me, or when I was younger, came to the pastors I was under, and those parents, before it got too late, they humbled themselves and said, hey, something's not working. Something's not connecting. Something's not clicking with our family. Can you help us? Then they received help, and I saw um, success in the right direction. But you know most parents don't do that. Most parents hold on to that false sense of security and say, well, if we just keep coming to church, someday they'll get it. If we keep just reading the Bible, someday they'll get it. If we just send them to a Christian school, someday they'll get it, only to realize 20 years later that false sense of security did nothing for them, and their kids did not get it. So, you cannot instill the love of God in your child's heart. The best thing you can do for them is show them what it looks like every day, not just once a week. The love of God, folks. The love of God. Does there need to be rules? Yes. There's got to be some you know, boundaries and wrongs and rights. But if your Christian life is defined by rules, I can tell you right now, that's a big problem. My Christian life is not defined by rules. My Christian life is defined by I love God. Because I love God, there are things I will do and there are things I will not do. Because I love God. It always goes back to that for me. I glorify God because I love God. I worship God because I love God. I obey God because I love God. Isn't that what he said? If you love me, keep my commandments. A lot of Christian families, do this, don't do this, go here, don't go here, wear this, don't wear this. It's, a, it's okay to get a temporary tattoo, not a, not a t- permanent tattoo. It's okay to get temporary dye, not permanent dye. I mean, it, it's just like these, wh- where do you get these rules? Why are some rules okay and some not? You can't explain it. It's a list of unlimited rules. And you hope against hope that your kids will think these rules are going to change their life and will embrace the rules and become godly individuals? No, when they hit middle school, they say, what's up with that, man? I'm out of here. And your life's going to be horrible (laughs) until they finally do leave, and then their life's going to be horrible until they figure it out. Some will, some won't. Christianity is not rules. They will know you by your love. That's what Christ said. He said to his disciples, He said, those around will know you're my disciples by your love one to another. If that's what works for disciples and strangers, you better believe it's what works for parents and kids. Parents, stop making Christianity about rules. You are hurting your kids. It's about love. Show them what that looks like and be humble enough to accept the fact that some of the rules you were told when you were young maybe aren't actually even in the Bible. And you're probably not helping your kids by passing on unbiblical rules. And if there's going to be do's and don'ts, rights and wrongs, as there should be, always make it about love. We do these because we love. We don't do these because we love. We go places like this because we love. We go to church because we love. We don't go to clubs because we love. It's about love. Not we do this because, uh, you know, if we do, God gives us something. And we don't because if we won't, God's going to strike our house down with fire and brimstone. You know, don't make it about that. It's about love. And then show them what that looks like. In the end, your child still has to make their own choice. But give them the best chance of success. And be cautious. When you allow evil near your home, it's just one step away from being in your home, whether that is a school, public or otherwise, family or friends. I will end with this. There are people I am related to that my children do not know and will not know. I'm not talking like third cousins related. I'm talking about very close relations. I love them. My children will not know them. Why? 
because they're making evil choices. And as much as I love these people who are in my family, I love my kids more, and I have a big responsibility to my kids. And I will not let evil near my home, even when that evil is a family member. I will not let it happen. In the end, my kids must make their own choice. But as a dad, it's my responsibility to give them the best chance of success. All right, we're going to end. Are there any questions or comments you guys would like to make? Not required, but it's a Bible study. I do like for you guys to have a chance to interact. For those watching online, if you have a question or comment you'd like to make on Facebook, you are always welcome to do so. And by the way, you don't have to wait until I'm done and I ask that question. You can even you know, write a question while I'm talking, and then I can answer it later. I don't see any questions on Facebook now. Are there any here in the congregation? you just have a question or comment you want to make? You're just processing the information right now, right? Okay. Well, as we go through the book of Judges, I will always, to the best of my ability of time, allow for questions or comments. So maybe if you're reading ahead and I didn't maybe cover something that you read, please you know, raise your hand at the end or even as I'm at that section, we'll discuss that and deal with it. And uh, I don't want to just deal with the things I bring. I do want to deal with and touch on the things that maybe you're curious about as well. Let's go ahead and pray and we'll dismiss. Dear Lord, I thank you for tonight, for the chance to look in the book of Judges and what we learned from it. I pray you would help us to be leaders, leaders who love and show others what that looks like, that they may join us in our connection with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great night, folks. I love you.